and our cybersecurity in UK manufacturing. I'll go again. Thank you everyone for joining today's um, webinar on cybersecurity in UK manufacturing. Um, as mentioned, my name is Verity Davidge. I am Director of Policy here at Make UK um, and also Chair of today's uh, webinar. I'm delighted to be joined by such an expert uh, panel, all of, um, all of whom will, you will get to hear from a bit later. Uh, we have James Broom from Make UK, Baldeep uh, Dogra from Black Blackberry, Mark Brown from BSI and uh, Tyler Schofield from the Addison Group. But before we really kick off, and we were going to be starting uh, with James, who's going to actually take us through the real top line uh, findings of our survey. Um, let me actually take us back to a little bit of context, because really, why are we looking at cybersecurity in UK manufacturing right now? You know, why is it it's so important? And what, because what we are seeing really is that the manufacturing industry is really moving towards increased digitalization and automation. It is great that so many manufacturers are now embracing new technologies, new practices and connected IoT systems, because if they don't do so, actually, we are at risk of being uncompetitive. But through all of that great investment that we are seeing through all the benefits that companies are reaping through using digital technologies, greater energy, greater efficiency, greater productivity, some increased pro uh, profitability, there are also some risks. And one of the major risks that we have seen is the increase in cybersecurity. It is the reason that uh, Make UK has today teamed up with BlackBerry Cybersecurity and Tech UK to share with you some of the findings of our recent report, but also to look at how our companies preventing cyber attacks within their business and what measures are UK manufacturers using and adopting to minimise that risk and the vulnerabilities and costs. So hopefully you'll hear a little bit of insight into what we found, but also some really great ideas about how you can protect your business and you, how you can ensure that you can continue to to adopt digital technologies without fear of cyber attacks. So on that note, I'm going to hand over to our first panelist, uh, James Broom. James, over to you. Thank you very much, Verity, and good morning, everyone. Uh, just a moment while I pull up some slides, and I'm going to take you through a whistle-stop tour of, um, of the key findings of our report that we've published in partnership with BlackBerry Cybersecurity. Um, this follows on from a report on cybersecurity that we undertook the year prior. So we have some interesting trend data uh, as well. I'll spend about 10 minutes uh, going through, and this will also set the scene for the discussion that we're going to have uh, following this as well. Um, I'll start by, by covering off the, the, the high level data that shows the importance of cybersecurity in UK manufacturing and, and how it's grown. Uh, then uh, have a look at the drivers of cybersecurity. So what I mean by that is what's what's driving companies to enhance their strategy and indeed what, what those risk multipliers are, uh, exactly what kind of action the industry is taking. And then moving on to a curious question, which is the liability for cybersecurity uh, within a corporate structure, uh, which we see is evolving um, as, as the risks become more severe and indeed the, the pitfalls uh, become more severe. And then finally, what, what are the barriers uh, the manufacturers are facing today in becoming uh, more cyber secure or indeed expanding their cyber security strategy. Um, so manufacturers are, are well aware uh, of the threat which cyber attacks pose. As we can see, 95% of manufacturers agree that cyber security is necessary for their company uh, with 100% of large businesses. So we're defining large businesses as those with a 500 or greater workforce reporting that cybersecurity is necessary for their business. 91% of manufacturers either agree or somewhat agree that they have access to sufficient information uh, and, advi ad and advice to confidently assess the specific cyber risk that, fa that faces their business. However, the majority are at the lower end of the scale with only, some, only somewhat agreeing. Similarly, while 88% are confident that their company is prepared with the right tools uh, and technologies to deal with a cybersecurity incident, 61% only somewhat agree again, highlighting that room for improvement or that not total certainty. Um, while the majority of companies may feel confident with the preparations already in place, three quarters uh, do recognize the need to expand their cybersecurity strategy. Uh, only 6%, which is a very small quantity of the industry, are fully satisfied with the cybersecurity strategy as it currently stands which illustrates uh, the perpetual growth that we're seeing later on in the report that a cybersecurity strategy 
uh, it can't just be set and forgotten. It needs to be constantly uh, a living, breathing thing. Uh, just over a third uh, report that vulnerability inhibits technology investment. Uh, and this group highlights a key area where technological processes are being limited by the threat of cyber incidents. And this plays into something I'll talk about in a moment around the drivers and risk multipliers uh, with added technology in the business and the, and the, the greater risk to cybersecurity that brings. Uh, one in five manufacturers uh, do not at least comprehensively secure their operational technology equipment. And this highlights the confidence gap, which is the perception of cybersecurity uh, importance, as, as we see at the top, is almost uni unilateral. Um, but the actual reported deployment of security measures uh, in businesses falls below those required levels and falls below levels that manufacturers report knowing that they need. So what, what are the fallouts and what are the, the primary fallouts uh, from manufacturer, manufacturing businesses' point of view uh, if they fall subject to an attack? Um, so many fallouts for a cyber attack is, are, as expected, disruption to operations, uh, as we see there, cited by 65%, and damage to reputation with customers and suppliers, which is cited by 43%. But interestingly, IP theft... Um, is a growing concern in the manufacturing sector. Uh, unique IP distinguishes manufacturers from one another and, of course, drives competition. And our research shows that almost one-fifth considered uh, the theft of IP to be a primary fallout from, from cyber attack. And, of course, when I refer to IP, I'm referring to intellectual property, uh, which is an umbrella term which covers copyrights, trademarks, and patents and the like. Um, so for manufacturers, creative design and ideas, manufacturing processes, machinery, um, innovation, data, trade secrets, so on, can all be digitally stored, uh, which in turn are vulnerable to, to theft through these cyber attacks. And in terms of the propensity of the attack and that cost, so the cost of an attack, just under 11% suggested suffering, which is the left graph here, um, suffering a loss due to an attack, due to an attack, with 31% saying that if they did suffer an attack, their defenses thwarted the impact. Now, what I've put up here is an indicative example, as is probably not surprising, um, quite sensitive data assessing and sharing um, how, how much of a financial impact um, a manufacturer uh, sort of received uh, when they suffered an attack. But so this is indicative, but it's a very small sample compared to the overall sample by nature of uh, many, many manufacturers opting uh, not to share that sensitive data. So what about that growth I mentioned at the start? So we can see here that quite clearly with the left pie chart in the past 12 months, the proportion of industry that are reporting that the importance of cybersecurity to their business in the last year has increased 65%. So essentially uh, just shy of two out of three. But those very, very little have suggested the importance have decreased with the other third essentially saying it has stayed the same. So pretty much right the way across industry, we can conclude that the importance of cybersecurity has either grown, which is in the proportion, or stayed the same. So it's certainly not traveling backwards. And you can, through reverse inference, understand that the threat is not going away, or indeed the threat hasn't abated. Uh, interestingly, when we cut down that data by company size here, which we can see on the right, um, we can see that actually the importance of cybersecurity has a, has a somewhat a small positive correlation um, the larger the company is, that we see it's becoming uh, disproportionately in the past year more important to larger companies uh, by comparison to smaller companies. But right the way across the board, uh, we can see uh, whatever the company size that the importance is um, of cybersecurity is growing. Um, and a little bit about targeted and untargeted attacks. So um, we have this question that we wanted to address about how how what proportion of attacks um, that that happen to uh, businesses within the UK manufacturing industry are targeted or, or untargeted. And what we mean by that is uh, specifically the company has been identified because the attacker wants to um, perhaps extract their IP or particularly target the company and untargeted would be an example would be an unfortunate uh, virus or perhaps ransomware that, um, that an employee has opened. And in terms of the perception from those businesses, 43% um, who faced an attack in the last 12 months uh, perceived that attack to be targeted i.e. designed specifically for that uh, company. Uh, with those of 1,000 plus employees, it went up to 80% um, reporting uh, that those attacks are targeted, implying that the larger the company, the more likely uh, the attack is going to be specifically targeted towards that firm. Uh, while this figure is worrying, 
Um, another cause for concern is that 21% of manufacturers don't know if their experienced cyber attack is targeted or not. So moving on to what's driving um, manufacturers' expansion of their cybersecurity strategies. Uh, manufacturers who have implemented um, technologies with, that fall under the umbrella term, the industrial internet of things, report it to be the biggest driver in increasing their overall level of organizational cybersecurity. Um, IoT, uh, Internet of Things, in comparison to augmented and virtual reality, for example, can often lie closer to the heart of a manufacturing production process and in turn become operationally critical. So whether it be sensors throughout the plant to ensure quality of the production line or whole line units themselves, the criticality to manufacturers is evidenced by the 30% of industry reporting that the implementation of the IoT within their business has uh, subsequently led them to increase their levels of cybersecurity. So we can see here the second largest driver of enhanced cybersecurity is artificial intelligence, uh, with 21% uh, suggesting that it's driving their expansion of their strategy, followed by automation with 18% reporting the same effect. Um, however, as manufacturers digitalize their factories, um, they are experiencing an increased need for cybersecurity skills, with 45% of manufacturers suggesting cybersecurity skills as a, as a significant barrier to why they're not being able to expand their strategy or not successfully expand it. So those risks, what are the main risks that are driving uh, their, their vulnerability? Um, so legacy IT uh, presents as the most prolific cybersecurity risk in the UK industry, as, as identified by 44.6%. Indeed, if we look at significant cyber attacks that are reported in media by, by brand names, well, this happens to brand names and in institutions, it's often found out that much of the infrastructure was indeed running on legacy operating systems and the like, which uh, so often is the weak chink in the armor. Um, so legacy IT proves a cybersecurity threat because if the developer is not actively, of course, patching the software, there are likely exploits to be found in the future and more readily um, if it's not up to date. And I think a good example of this is, of course, in the 2017 uh, WannaCry uh, global ransomware attack that came to national attention when it struck the NHS. Those of you might remember, it was a large, very large headline news story at the time, brought the NHS's um, IT system to its knees. And indeed, it also struck one of the largest car manufacturers in the UK, uh, which caused production stoppages uh, running up into the cost of millions. Uh, also, Renault in France was also struck, uh, and production stoppage was also reported as a result. And indeed, the, this attack in this instance, and others like it, almost exclusively affected legacy versions of the uh, Microsoft Windows uh, operating system. So what about defense? What, what, what defense is a manufacturer putting in place to combat this? And indeed, what's the, 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 the spread of the spectrum of how those defenses are implemented? Well, we can see here, actually, the most interesting thing is, is how the, the survey data reveals uh, fairly, two fairly clear tiers. Uh, so you can see the top two there at around high 80s and then the bottom three at about equally at about 76 percent what this reveals is that there's a cohort of the industry that essentially stop antivirus and firewalls and don't go further with uh, those following options secure settings network wide system and software updates and controlled access to electronic data and the difference here is about 10 to 15 percent uh, but the encouraging sign here is that still, in any case, it's a majority are still using these more expanded strategies uh, in this, these frontline necessary strategies, I should say, um, with about 10 to 15 percent only stopping their strategy at just the antivirus software and firewalls. A quick bit on where manufacturers perceive the threat from. Um, so this question is critically not necessarily where the threat is from. This is where UK manufacturers on aggregate perceive their cybersecurity threat to originate from. So Russia and China, very, very close um, in terms of where the perceived threat originates from. And then in third was the UK with uh, other countries falling um, far behind in the numbers. In terms of proportionality between the likelihood of uh, business action on cybersecurity training, as I touched on earlier, and the size of company, uh, there's a very revealing graph here, which has very strong correlation uh, between the size of company and the likelihood for it to have mandatory cybersecurity training for its employees. So you see here in the 1,000 plus category, so that is 1,000 plus employees um, in those companies, 100 percent of companies that fall within that category have mandatory cybersecurity training, which down right into micro business level, which is zero to nine employees, uh, drops down to 50% and, and very proportional throughout the spectrum of companies there, as we can, as we can see below. As I mentioned at the start, 
or look at the corporate structure. So we can see here quite quite a lot to, to chop through here. I'll just leave this on screen. I won't I won't go through every single one. But all these questions relate to liability for cybersecurity within the corporate structure. So where does that responsibility lie? And particularly important as the cyber threat increases and indeed as the importance of cybersecurity to manufacturers becomes more important, um, it, it, it's likely to go up the um, responsibility chain up towards um, board level, especially as the fallout can be ever so more severe. Um, so a pullout here is 61% um, report that the responsibility of, of their operational technology security lies and ends with the operational team. And we see the least um, prolific response, which is right at the bottom there, uh, with only 35% of the industry reporting to have a chief information security uh, officer. However, we see just one above that, 46% report that cybersecurity is indeed a regular item of a board agenda if it is not formalized into a role within itself. In terms of demonstrating security um, to suppliers and customers and, and what the future landscape might look at, uh, might look like in terms of uh, being needing to demonstrate um, robustness in order to secure um, business, our research finds that it is more likely for a manufacturer to be asked themselves to demonstrate sufficient levels of cybersecurity in their business than for manufacturers to make that same expectation of their suppliers. Together, uh, this implies that there's a, a bias in the supply chain, that as we move up toward the final uh, original equipment manufacturer, or in other words, the final product producer, uh, a greater emphasis on supplier cybersecurity bus robustness um, is revealed. Almost half, uh, so 45% of manufacturers report having been asked to demonstrate or guarantee the robustness of their cybersecurity processes as part of a contract or other business agreement and successfully, um, and successfully satisfying that request. 10% uh, report having been asked, but failed to satisfy the challenge. However, only 23% of manufacturers report asking their suppliers to demonstrate the same cyber robustness as a routine part of their business practice. 21% reported asking their suppliers as much as an extraordinary measure, with 48% indicating they had never challenged a supplier in, in such a way. So it's the final, final slide by me, and I think this is looking forwards as to what are the what are the barriers to becoming even more cyber secure in the future? Future. So we've seen uh, from the very start that importance, uh, the perception of cyber security importance by UK manufacturers is almost unilaterally high across the board. And we see here the top two barriers listed are both related to cost. The first of which the cost of cyber security products, and then following the time and or cost in maintaining those very security systems. The first. Uh, the following the third point, but the first one not related to cost, as we've seen, is the lack of training on cybersecurity for employees, which reveals something interesting because we saw, if you remember a couple of slides ago, uh, we saw a graph that indicated that especially as we move towards large companies, uh, uh, the majority of industry have mandated cybersecurity training for employees, yet still the lack of training on cybersecurity for employees remains a barrier to change, which implies that either in its current form, it doesn't go far enough or it is not sufficient um, to suitably negate that risk. So I'll hand back to the chair now. Thanks, James. Um, lots of really great insight, lots of things for us to get into our teeth into, um, and I'm, I'm guessing lots of questions that are going to come from that presentation. And just a reminder again, if you have um, a question or even a comment, um, do put it in the chat box and we will be picking that up. So, um, Baldeep, if I can go to you first, your ref reflections and thoughts on what James has presented there. Is that what you're hearing in with the companies that you've been speaking to? Tell us a little bit more about um, BlackBerry and yeah, give us your thoughts. Well, thank you for that, Verity. Great summary, James. Um, I'm going to kick off by just introducing myself. Bell Dogra, I've been in BlackBerry for the best part of two decades, uh, primarily in technical leadership positions. Uh, I'm currently a senior director for technical and solutions marketing within our cybersecurity product marketing group. I'm just going to share a slide just to give you some insight into where BlackBerry is today. Uh, and there is a reason why. Um, so this demonstrates our journey where we don't make devices anymore. That's the message I wanted to get across. Uh, we've evolved after successfully pivoting from a, a hardware um, to a software organization, 2013-14. We're now a cybersecurity and IoT company with a strong focus on zero trust security and balancing that security 
with user experience for any user on practically any endpoint, anytime and anywhere. So anything from cars, even the space station and nuclear power stations. Um, so just wanted to make sure I get that across. Now, in terms of the uh, what James presented, it was an excellent summary. And now, while there are definitely cybersecurity challenges in other sectors, the challenges in manufacturing, as James presented, are unique. And what this report does is, is highlight those in, in a really, really big way. Um, being cyber ready, I think, is a big one of those. And in the report, we learned that losses ranged from 50 to 250K. And, and legacy IT accounted for about 45% of that risk. Um, now, operational technology that relies on IT will dictate organizational reliance and on on that legacy it so key takeaway from that is that supporting legacy it is is absolutely critical um even though with all the transformation projects out there legacy it will still remain whether during and after those projects due to reliance on the interconnectivity with with operational technology systems for example, there could be reliance on specific data warehousing software or HMI command and control interfaces into the ICS systems. Um, now, we also know that many uh, factory floor IT systems uh, are working in an air-gapped environment. So we need to make sure you can uh, execute against threats on the endpoints themselves and not have any reliance to the cloud um, to support those isolated networks. Now, we know ransomware is on the rise and the number one concern of manufacturing CISOs, you know, across the board and ransomware targeting isolated areas of infrastructure uh, is on the rise as well. And one example is the rise of Lockbit and Conti ransomware on, on those isolated networks. There's also, um, as highlighted in the report, the challenge of insider risk, which is being highlighted in uh, too. It's crucial. Uh, to ensure credentials don't get compromised. And this could be anything from user hygiene, which is passwords, uh, to the security and management of identities. All right, then that, that's a key aspect of that. Now we understand those challenges and uh, you know we've got a solution that can fit very well into in the manufacturing environment to tackle them, which is built on securing endpoints, empowering people and augmenting cyber skills while also um, assisting and improving process and technology. So you've got the people, process, technology all covered. So that's a key part of, you know, what I feel this report brings. Uh, Verity, back to you. Great, thank you. And I think, you know, spot on there when you talk about, you know, the unique challenges of, of manufacturing. I think we can we can talk about cybersecurity as a whole and its impact on business and even, you know, ourselves as employees changing our passwords, using two-step processes, exactly. all of that. It impacts all of our lives, but manufacturing is is somewhat unique um, in those potential cyber attacks. So maybe then we can go to Tyler. Um, Tyler, from your perspective as manufacturer, you know, how does what James presents uh, resonate with you? Is there anything from your business that you are seeing, any kind of strategies that you are implementing to mitigate those potential risks? So it, it, it really reinforces the existing agenda, really, of everything that's going, been going on for the past five, six years. Um, manufacturing is slightly different to some other industries due to the fact that every minute that something is down or not working, especially when it comes to multiple systems, it's, it's money lost and that hits harder than a lot of other factors. Um, there's there's a lot of things to consider when you're a manufacturer. You you want to invest the money uh, to make the process more efficient and better, but then you also you're causing issues with widening with widening your, uh, your your attack surface. So you you have to balance and you have to be sure that when you implement something, you are securing it as best you can, so that it doesn't become a a weakness in the in the chain. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very difficult. Um, the, the, in the past six years, there's been a lot that's that a lot that's changed. There's constantly new different types of ransomware coming out. Ransomware is a big one. Um, there's constantly new things being released week after week that can cause 
hundreds of thousands, if not millions of pounds worth of damage. Um, and you don't want like something like that to be affecting your business. You, you also need to make sure that you don't get cyber fatigue in, in these areas so that you, you keep on top of things really well for the first two or three or four years. And then because it's, because it's quite quiet and nothing ever happens, you kind of turn a blind eye or you stop being as uh, diligent as you would have been previously so that you can check all of your systems or check whichever seam you have that integrates with any other kind of platform. Uh, and, you, and you start to kind of uh, take your eye off the ball a little bit. You need to make sure that you uh, you don't do that either. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that really chimes with the report's findings. And when James talk, spoke about the confidence gap, because almost, you know, we know companies are saying, oh, cybersecurity is really important. And, you know, we're on top of it, or they think that they're, they're on top of it. But actually, the deployment of mitigating strategies is probably perhaps a little bit limited, particularly maybe in those small and medium sized firms. Um, Mark, can I bring you in and give a bit of BSI's perspective on this? Yeah, so a brief introduction. So Mark Brown, I'm the Global Managing Director for Digital Trust Consulting at the British Standards Institution, but you know, uh, with a keen interest in this area, having spent uh, eight of the past 12 years involved in all aspects of manufacturing, uh, both as a you know, global CISO at uh, SAB Miller previously from a consumer goods manufacturing, uh, being involved as the CIO, CTO at Spectris, which is industrial engineering, and then previous to joining BSI running Wipro's Industry 4.0 practice. And if I look back across the experiences, I think the key piece that many organizations struggle with is they think of all aspects of the issues that have been discussed as technology. And to an extent, it is all technology. But the manner in which you can secure those technologies is completely different. Many of the solutions and the processes that are, you know, work in an IT environment simply are not applicable in an OT environment. As many of the, the previous speakers have mentioned, the impact of you know, failure of security uh, in the OT environment, in the industrial manufacturing environment, can sometimes run into you know, much more significant numbers than it ever does in an IT environment. But the second piece is the mindset. There has often been a case that you know the IT professional has never had to deal with the OT or the IoT environments. They've been kept very separate. And that's changed since, as James mentioned, since WannaCry in 2017, where many boards and many executives have said, well, this is all technology, therefore the CIO and the CISO need to go and help the OT or the industrial security elements. But they try and take this very same approaches. If we look traditionally across you know, the IT environment, we focus on the, the normal triad of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. If we look at the industrial space, we add a fourth dimension, which comes first, which is safety. And, and in many environments, safety is absolutely critical in the manufacturing space. But then availability typically comes second, integrity comes third, and confidentiality is somewhat a nice to have in the environment as long as those other three are in place. So that mindset shift of people who are looking to help with the cybersecurity of the environments is key that they need to recognize these are not one in the same approaches that you cannot deploy active technologies into the environment. You can't simply you know, deploy the same approaches, policies and processes from an IT into an OT or an otherwise industrial environment. Doing so actually could cause greater challenges than not doing anything at all. Um, so you know, it's a real mindset and cultural awareness that's required in the main to move this issue forward. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll come on to that in a little bit more detail, I think, um, uh, later. Mark, well, I've got you off, my, um, off the mic um, before um, I go to others. Um, you know, one of the interests, many of one of the many interesting stats in the report was 
um, this fact that 37% of manufacturers suggest that this vulnerability around um, its potential cyber attack is actually preventing them from investing in digital technologies even further. You know, what can you know security providers, stakeholders, and businesses themselves do to really dismantle this barrier? Because what we don't want to do is, you know, stop companies from digitizing yeah. their, their factories, their processes, reaping those benefits. But it does feel like there still is that slight nervousness about yeah. a cyber attack. Yeah, and it, it really follows on Verity from my previous comment about you know the, the change in mindset and awareness. The key for me is you know, a bit of a historian buff here is if you, if we look back at Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations, you know the, you know the the first law of economics is to make profit you have to take risk, and that is really applicable here to the role of cybersecurity and digital transformation that we're seeing in businesses. Because if businesses don't invest, will they continue to exist in a number of years' time? We, we can look back to a report that was conducted by Forbes in, in May 2020, when we're still you know, right at the initial height of COVID, and they spoke to the Fortune 1000 CEOs, and over 75% of them said that you know, they had to spend on digital transformation to maintain relevance and existence going forward. So for me, the, the, the Make UK and the manufacturing sector throughout the UK has to recognise that they can't manage all the risk out of the environment. And what's the bigger risk? Is, is the bigger risk not to invest and not to survive or to recognise that the risk is a double-edged sword? Yes, there can be negative risk, by embracing that positive risk, by enabling business, but putting alongside that the enabling controls of not prevention, prevent where you can, but it is very difficult to have 100% prevention of 100% of technology 100% of the time. The key is to focus now on detective monitoring controls. And indeed at BSI, we're moving away from the terms of cyber security, and indeed cyber resilience. You know, we, we focus more on digital trust and breach resilience. How you know the inevitable will happen. There, there's a cyber attack globally once every 39 seconds. You know, that's over 2,000 attacks per day. So breaches will happen. The key is how do you ensure breach resilience? So if you are hit that it doesn't completely undermine your company and you can continue to operate and survive and then thrive beyond that. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't know if any of the other panellists, if you want to come off mute and um, add to, to what Mark said that there, because he's probably third on another thought. Val, I'll go to you. Yeah, I think, um, well, first thing with Mark on, on the fact it's not just a, um, it's not just about technology, right? And for, from a barrier perspective, you know, there's you got to think about the the different problems that IT and OT answer to, right? The two completely different uh, ways of thinking, um, and not not just the, the thinking, the the different rules and the stacks that they're all built on, the architectures and and the security protocols as well. Um, and I believe that's kind of what's responsible for some of those barriers. And yeah, we've we, we've got attacks uh, every day, and our own research kind of uncovered like a, a attack a minute which which kind of resonates with what with with what mark just said it's how do you balance that risk and i think a lot of uh, manufacturing firms out there are trying to understand what that means not just in terms of technology but also in terms of their skills uh, and also the processes that they, they need to kind of adopt and change and getting those teams talking to each other the it and ot teams uh, talking to each other so that's one perspective Absolutely. And, you know, one of the questions I was actually going to ask you about next was, you know, one of the, the report revealed that the industrial Internet of Things was the most kind of driving technology that companies saw increasing cybersecurity risks within their business, um, closely followed by, I think, artificial intelligence. You know, these technologies have probably helped companies enhance their productivity, but they also increase the attack service of the business. So how can businesses best mitigate that increased threat? Yeah, that um, Mark made a really interesting point uh, on Industry 4.0, and you know, to to me and and to many others, it's driving that new era 
of interconnectivity in in manufacturing where ot systems become more connected i mean you know that's the the vision uh of of having that convergence of it iot uh, and ot which isn't just about technology but it's about increasing automation which in turn would be expected to drive efficiency I mean, manufacturing firms need to be efficient they want to be more efficient and ai helps automation helps other simplified processes like blockchain helps um but that means more connectedness and that means more risk through increased exposure uh it's not just ot and iot sensors and systems that are at risk those systems produce a huge amount of and you know but you know there's an exponential rise uh in data volumes right and that will impact the it systems that manage and secures that data mm. now the way to get to that data is through the attack surface uh which is built on the endpoints and and on the it backbone including those systems that tend to sit in air gap in, uh, air gap networks you'll see a lot of that in manufacturing firms um so that attack surface is where we need to to focus our attention right you, you, if you imagine a threat funnel the attack surface would be right at the top you know the more connected infrastructure that offers itself to the attack surface the wider it becomes the more challenging it would be to narrow it and and uh narrow that funnel and manage you know manage it and reduce that risk um now traditional cyber security uh, technologies implemented in it infrastructure may struggle to keep up now in the report uh, for example we see 90 percent of businesses surveyed still use traditional antivirus so businesses in that situation would be best advised to look at employing better attack surface management through you know more of a zero trust you know more modern frameworks like zero trust for example and maintain active security controls that sit underneath that minimize exposure and like mark said you know there will be breaches how do you minimize those breaches from wrecking havoc right if not to fully prevent them from happening in the first place so time is a critical factor and uh when you think about ransomware as being the most prevalent um there are others such as denial of service and malware introduced into isolated networks there's stuxnet for example which impacted the operations at a nuclear power plant there's a rise of ransomware like lockbit uh in isolated networks so my my advice my kind of view would be uh stay ahead be preventative as much as possible reduce what we call the mean time to respond or NTTR keep it low um and ensure that you've got full visibility across your estate across your attack surface and make sure that the SOC teams and the IT teams are talking to each other right and you need those communications and that cooperation to help that happen absolutely really interesting and then i also um what's another kind of interesting area of the report is around the the supply chain and the the proportion of companies that are now being asked to demonstrate their robustness of their cyber security in their supply chain and you know i know james and i have been doing some work recently on supply chains and um one of the, the challenges is that they're very complex um and actually not companies don't really have always the visibility of their supply chain so it makes it all very much very challenging um D james do you think that do you see cyber security reputation and um and being able to demonstrate robustness as being increasing importance when you're speaking to um manufacturers I think it's a very interesting time for, for supply chains and, and, and supplier selection at the moment. I mean, just, just before that, um, about, about what, what impact on cyber robustness is having on your selection likelihoods and indeed your, your sort of business, business market um, preferences. Um, we're already seeing a, almost an evolution in the typical dichotomy of the price quality argument. Um, and that's even before we get on to security robustness credentials. So we're seeing at the moment that, you know, near shoring for, for different reasons about supply chain assuredity, uh, which is more of a, a hangover from, from the pandemic that is stuck around now uh, about shortening lead times um, in, in a very limited supply environment. We're also seeing the, the growth of friend shoring, which is a slightly ethereal term, but of course um, that, that's to do with uh, moving suppliers away from, from contested geopolitical um, nations and so on and so forth um, and what that's doing and then we throw in as well uh, as we've seen in the report the data around supplier selection based on on um, on being able to demonstrate your cyber robustness what these things are doing are, of course they're they're upsetting or disrupting I should say the more uh, traditional 
uh, duo, duo of just price and quality uh, when it comes to um, procurement and selecting selecting companies within your supply chain. Um, one interesting thing, as we as I mentioned in the overview as well, uh, we can see that this is certainly a phenomenon. The report reveals that it, it's it's moving up the chain. So that uh, it, the higher up the the final chain is, as I mentioned, the more likely a manufacturers uh, have to officially demonstrate its um its cyber security robustness as part of, of part of that business agreement. Uh, if we combine that with what we saw earlier around the importance and the rate at which uh, manufacturers are perceiving the importance of manufacturing, indeed deploying um, deploying interventions compared to last year and then this year, um, it's roundly inevitable as well. And we ran this data last year. I didn't present it in the overview that the, it has grown as well um, this year compared to last. Um, the rate at which manufacturers are being asked to demonstrate that security, and what we what we don't know. Um, is the proportion, but it's interesting, the proportion of those that failed essentially the check, that failed uh, to demonstrate their cybersecurity robustness when asked to uh, by a customer or supplier, whether then they lost that contract or indeed they turned around, rectified their shortcomings and then and then came back to continue doing business. So just how much so is that reputational risk in the future? But one thing that is very, very clear is that it's growing in importance and it's almost inevitable um, that it will eventually um, sit alongside or in the same field as price and quality, as we are already seeing with lead time, uh, ge geographic location, um, uh, along with that near shoring and friend shoring piece as well. Great, thanks so much for that. Um, Tyler, if I can go to you um, next. Um, the, report, the report revealed that limited cybersecurity skills within the business was actually cited as one of the most significant concerns to manufacturers overall cybersecurity vulnerability you know we talk about manufacturing and access to skills technical skills every kind of skill but here we're honing in on um, cybersecurity skills um so there's a skills problem if you will in the business yet not everyone is even offering some kind of formalized training on cybersecurity how can this gap between the skills vulnerability and rectifying it really be closed what com what com what should companies be doing really in this area so it's, it's really a four or five step process. It, it, it should be a five step process, but some companies might not want to maximize the benefits. So they skip one of the steps, but essentially um, it, it starts off by identif identifying the skills that are missing within the, the, the technical teams and then prioritizing which skills you need inside your organization. Um, cyber, learning it gives people the opportunity to discover new skills and rediscover any old ones that they may have just forgotten um it is a fairly painstaking process but it is necessary to improve the organization any any organization's security post posture um one thing that can can one thing that causes the the skill gap is is um stagnant one-off training uh, which is only performed every three or four years, whether it's whether it's a it's, it's a financial thing, it's an investment thing, or whether it's a, people disagree with um, how important it is. Uh, but because it is such a rapidly evolving field, the constant emerging threat, it is necessary to to promote continuous cyber learning so that employees' skills and knowledge stay up to date. So the first thing you really should be doing is uh, building a cybersecurity competency model which um you can which starts by basically essentially defining the competence competencies you need for each job within your technical teams you need to identify the ksis which are ksa sorry which are knowledge skills and abilities and you need to identify which of them are required to excel in each given position um, the competency model then defines what should be aligned with the organization's strategic plan, as well as any uh, information dictated by the uh, by NICE, the National Initiative for Cybersecurity and Education Cybersecurity Workforce Framework. Um, once you've managed to build your competency model, you're essentially finding out where are you currently. The second step is to is to find out where you should be. So with the cybersecurity 
competency model in place, the next step is really to see how your technical team stack up against that model. Uh, and you can map skills you have to hand and they'll provide a clear view on your organization's skill gap. Uh, you can determine where training is needed, where resources should be allocated and how to prepare proactively for future threats. You can have it in order to gain this kind of skill map or to finalize the skill map, you can have employees assess their own proficiency using self surveys or self assessments. You can ask employees what skills they have and what skills they want to attain. You may as well train someone that wants to gain the skill as opposed to doesn't really want the skill and doesn't really have any interest in it. Um, you can also ask them for feedback on how proficient they are with certain skills. Are they happy with the skills they've got? Are they unhappy with certain skills that they've got? Uh, you can gather a list of existing qualifications or certificates uh, from, from members of staff to, to prove who's completed specific degrees or courses or modules online, things like that. Uh, you can also use a, a skill assessment checklist or uh, some kind of hands-on assessment to determine what skills are needed. Um, you can include questions about professional development goals in performance reviews, if you conduct them, or if you can ask somebody who conducts these to find out where, what, what they want or where they're unhappy with certain things. Um, knowledgeable managers can use uh, rubrics tables to assess and score employee skills then identify skill gaps as well uh, and another thing that i try to do is identify skill silos and um, a strong team should have a diverse mix of strengths when it comes to uh, kind of meshing and blending well together and uh, Team evaluations can help you make informed decisions about training and development and prioritizing those skills that they need the most. And replacing a skill silo after they have left can be incredibly difficult and it can also be very expensive because of the, the, they, they may have some kind of niche experience that you want, you didn't realize is, is quite an expensive one to replace. Um, the, the the third step really is to identify the learning opportunity. So you've, you've found uh, where you are, you've found where you need to be. Now you need to find out how to get there. Um, now that you know where you currently are, the next step really is to identify learning opportunities to close that gap. Um, the main thing that most companies will turn to is, is by investing in a proper cybersecurity training uh, program for all your employees. Um, not only will training lower the risk of a breach through ensuring basic cyber awareness, but it also provides the opportunity to upskill your existing talent that you already have. Um, and cybersecurity training has proven a high return on investment. But there are a lot of companies out there that don't like making investments until they can see it physically within them. But sometimes, like, like what's been said quite a few times already today, you need to take the risk uh, by investing so that you can see a return. So that's quite not fizzled down into some, some companies yet, but it, it will eventually because something will end up happening and then they'll see what they, uh, what they could have had instead. Um, the other options are if you don't want to invest heavily in, 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 in a, a cybersecurity training um, platform or program, if you already um, use technology to create your curate sorry your own content then it's a fantastic opportunity really to put those skills to work to create resources and information internally which is centered around developing identified skills there's also uh, instructor training that people come to your business and maybe they sit down with you and they might show you uh, videos or kind of tailored not tailor-made content but they'll show you content to help you train as well um, there's online courses, kind of one-off online courses that, that will help close the skill gap, not as drastically as a, a, a proper cybersecurity training platform, but it will still help. Uh, there's also mentoring, so a knowledgeable manager or a knowledgeable member of staff uh, with more experience may be able to take a, one of the younger members of staff under the, his or her wing and teach them kind of share that knowledge. Um, there's also peer learning. So just uh, encourage kind of communication on into uh, between members of staff to help 
share the knowledge again. There's also online webinars. Some could be, some of them can be found for free. Some of them are, some of them are paid. Um, and there's also job shadowing and job sharing as well. So um, if you, you know, it kind of falls under the same umbrella as mentoring maybe, but it is, it's just another type that can help. Um, if you do decide to develop and curate tools and information internally, as opposed to investing in a, a, a cybersecurity platform, you need to be able to create engaging and appealing learning experiences. A vital part of implementing a process like this is to ensure that programs engage the employees in ways which drive and motivate them. Happy employees are on average 12% more productive than unhappy employees. It is also important to note though, that engaging learning does not need to go over the top. Sometimes something just as simple as easy as a quiz can be more effective than a complex puzzle game. Um, the final step, because I have rambled on for about 10 minutes, um, after all the time and effort and money has been put into creating or investing a, a modern learning plan or creating an, creating an, uh, internal uh, information and documentation or tools to help learn, you have to then measure the results. A great way of quantifying this is by using dashboards, which allows senior leadership or management to have an on-demand access to information which can help them assess an individual's performance or an individual's learning plan. Uh, you can also utilize analytics to track that noteworthy metrics to keep the learning programs on course. So if, if a lot of members of staff, for example, have a specific skill gap and you weren't aware, but now you are, you need to make sure that you're keeping an eye on that because if that's a big skill skill gap between all your members of staff that's a skill gap that can be easily closed um, you can track the number of team members who have acquired new skills in in try and track a number of team members who have acquired new skills in one key area other critical indicators include the overall skill levels of teams and the number of threats averted because of include improved skills so it's not just about how you grade their learning, it's how are they then putting that learning in place at, uh, in their roles or in the, whilst they're undertaking their responsibilities. Um, it is an ongoing process uh, and tracking its impact will help identify what your learning methods that do work and what don't work. And the feedback should help you in adapting the training material to maximize its effect. Thanks, Tyler. If any manufacturer ever asks me how do I solve the cyber skills challenge in my business, I am just going to refer them to that clip of you speaking. I feel like that was extremely thorough and welcome. So thank you so much for that. Um, just a reminder to attendees, if you've got a question, do pop it into the chat. There is one I'm going to go to in a minute. But um, just to pick up, I guess the point around, you know, cost and return on investment, you know, from a manufacturer's perspective, sometimes just even the cost of training, actually you need to offset by the return on investment that your employees are trained up to deal with um, cybersecurity instances. But one of the things from the report was, of course, that kind of limited use of defence, so firewalls predominantly, there was kind of less sophisticated defence. I guess a question to the panel more broadly is, for particularly like a small and medium sized company, what is that business case of setting out that kind of cost of real investment in cybersecurity protection and robustness, and then, then therefore the return on investment? And Mark has gone complete Zoom etiquette and raised his hand. <laughs> so I'm going to get him. Okay, so I've in all my time, it's 31 years in cybersecurity. I've always referred to one really simple formula, and I refer to it as the power of 8,760. Why that number? 24 times 365 is 8,760. Take your annual revenue and divide it by that, and that's the cost of one hour's downtime. There, there is your ROI for a cybersecurity investment because many of these solutions will cost less than the, one of, the cost of one hour's downtime. It, it's probably the simplest way to take what is a technological issue and put it into financial metrics. The, the second way to really then look at it is to recognize you're not alone. Many organizations, and Tyler rightly called out the, the steps that need to be looked at from sort of resolving a lot of these issues. 
is to actually say, well, do I need to have all of these myself or can I share it? So the concept of a virtual CISO, actually, do I need somebody full time or, or can I you know, go to a provider where I can get somebody two days a week or, or 10 days a month or eight, you know, 10, you know, 12 days a quarter? Somebody that can really showcase to me what's required. And, and the third piece is then really sort of think of it from a cost of, you know, as I mentioned earlier, what happens if I don't invest in this? Will I continue to exist as an organization in a few years' time? Yes, it, it can be a cost, but the bigger cost could be actually failing to exist in a company. And therefore, that failure to prepare is simply preparing to fail. Brilliant. Thank you. You've given me so, so many great sound bites from the, the panel. Um, about, I mean, from your perspective, cost of, you know, products, cost of cybersecurity products, cost, cost, cost do come up always as the top barrier. And of course, no manufacturer really has a, a whole load of cash in their, their pockets uh, right yeah. now in these challenging times. So is cost really a thing or is there a little bit of a perception issue here that actually the kind of cost of investing in cybersecurity um, is actually paid perhaps a lot less than companies think? Yeah, I was going to talk about um, cyber readiness. So to be prepared, like what Mark just said, uh, but he just reminded me of, a, of another incident, actually, the, the colonial pipeline, everyone's probably heard of what happened there. While they undenied about paying a, paying a ransom, which is a few i think it was about five million dollars they were losing 10 million dollars a day in lost operations and by failing to to do that over i think their response time was about four or five days um you know that overweighed the cost of implementing cyber readiness by you know by about 400 percent. it's just shocking uh how much they actually lost um so yeah you've got to be cyber prepared there is help out there right um if you know skills gaps can easily be 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 filled by existing skills you know there's mdr for example that uh, manage detection and response there's services uh to support um and it, you know it all comes down to being cyber resilient it's it's being ready and you know going back to what tyler was saying about skills um if you don't have the skills but you you get issues and you get problems you respond to those problems with point solutions and what you end up with is a whole load of these point solutions and you go back to technology um so yeah you got to you, you have to make sure you you plug in the skills gaps and 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 maintain a sense of readiness uh to those issues yeah, great. And I think the other area of interest is just where cybersecurity, you know, sits within the business. And James touched a little bit on this um, in some of the findings. You know, 58% of companies say they have a board director with responsibility <laughs> for uh, cybersecurity. But, you know, is that enough? Whose responsibility is it? Is it everyone's? Where should it be sitting in the business? I think fundamentally, um, and we, we, we've spoken a lot about IT and ot so you've got the cio and you've got the CISO. um fundamentally i think they would be the ultimate gatekeepers and hold the responsibility for, for for being cyber ready preventing cyber attacks dealing with cyber attacks um but as we see manufacturing companies grow their digital footprint and collect more and more data and perhaps even look at converging the factory floor you'll see them needing to be more compliant to existing and potentially emerging regulations so you probably see the clo take more interest uh in those matters going forwards but it's quite shocking i think uh, yeah it was in slide 11 that james showed that only 34 percent have a CISO uh of those responding and cybersecurity is only not even 50 percent on the board agenda um so there are some tacit examples that have to be fixed in manufacturing organizations to to be ready to be cyber ready and i think uh, the board should take more responsibility uh, fundamentally yeah indeed so again it's back to a little bit of that kind of confidence gap and i've just seen they've said that james has come off mute so he's going to come in there he goes with the hand yeah. up well i think it's <laughs> it, it's telling of um of the security services so the uk security services have identified this and i know from from talking to, to some manufacturers that 
they've been on a on a on a bit of a of a of a road show um with particularly those those manufacturers that are involved in sensitive supply chains with and i've i've actually been privy to watching a case study a, a sort of a, a, a dramatization video of of uh, exactly it run as almost like a like an, an episode off of off of netflix or something like that and um it's a, it's a very short video about a, a, an organization that exposes itself legally um uh, through through a a lack of a lack of responsibility within the boardroom and it shows this organization right the way down essentially on a shop floor uh, there's a there's a, a human risk that hasn't been identified that that moves into some air gapped ot that then the the mean time to response as, as baldi was talking about was very poor because there was no uh, sort of crisis committee because there was no uh, particularly nominated member in the board so it was all being kicked around so it's an interesting uh, point that's just identified right the way up at, at, at the overall UK security services they're bringing it to companies to make them aware that there's a apparently they've identified and as we've seen here you know can kicking of that responsibility that is leading to to leaving threats or, or holes within uh, within individual businesses to the point where it's 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 risking national security. Mark, over to you. Yeah, so I think, James, the, the, the point you raised there is actually something that many governments globally are actually struggling with. And it comes back to societal attitudes to cybersecurity. Everyone has you know, looked at it very much as a cost center. They've looked at it as something which inhibits the business over time. And if we look back and, and, you know, GDPR is a good example, you know, everyone kicked the can down the road on privacy and, you know, the fines that were in place for not having good data privacy uh, were seen as not really relevant. And we ended up with a sledgehammer to crack a nut in many respects. And, and what I would urge, you know, the community to recognise is that historically UK government doesn't like to legislate around this area it you know it, we only need to look at you know, the latest strategy it's no longer a cyber security strategy it's a cyber strategy from the uk government because that's actually saying you know this is something we can advance uk plc on but it will regulate if it needs to if everyone just sticks their head in the sand and says this isn't my problem and we only need to look over the water to see what has happened in the us where it's now mandatory for every organization to have a board director and at least one non-exec who is knowledgeable about cybersecurity. Mandatory breach reporting is coming in. You know, if we don't want that legislative enforcement to happen in the cybersecurity space, then companies have to wake up and recognize that they're going to have to stop kicking the can down the road and recognize in modern 21st century, in the 2020s, 2030s, digital is the way we will be running business. And it's no longer the CIO being, well, he's just the head, he or she is just the head of IT, doesn't deserve a seat at the table. You know, the CISO invariably reporting to the CIO. So that's gamekeeper and poacher in the same department. There needs to be independence. There needs to be a recognition that this is probably for many organizations a brand killer if they get it wrong, certainly in the smaller space. And unless they have that direct responsibility and accountability accepted and managed you know, on an ongoing, not once a year review of the risk register perspective, then you know, times will inevitably drive towards more serious consequences for business. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right there, Mark. It's almost that if if manufact if you know industry doesn't do enough, there will be a point when we see further legislation and regulation, and it won't be the type that businesses want, and they will then um, um, be frustrated with that. So we, it was almost going to be my next question of our manufacturers, you know, doing enough themselves. But Tyler, I'll just I'll bring you in because again, see your hand up there. Um, yeah, no, I was just kind of link what James said earlier and what Mark just said there. Um, James seemed to be answering the, uh, the, when he was answering the question about um, will uh, price and quality 
those two points will will cyber security or, or trustability or digital trustability will become a, a third or a tertiary uh, point that uh, companies will, will kind of mark you by. Uh, but I think it also answers Mark's Mark's comment uh, about earlier when he when he said that um, companies need to wake up. I think either you, we have two options really. Companies either wake up because they stop getting jobs, they stop getting work, they are cut off from their suppliers, cut off from um, all their 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 links, and and then they finally wake up and say, oh, well, we've dropping we've been dropping the ball quite badly here. Uh, we have been kicking the can quite a bit, so we need to step it up and put a real investment and spend some real time to get our cyber uh, trustability in the in the industry up to up to scratch and up to up to standard where it should be. If companies don't do that, the government will just bring in legislation that forces them to do it anyway, because yeah. it, it is it is how the world is going. Unless companies start to utilize a, like a blockchain type manufacturing uh, process, so instead of every every link in the chain having an individual cybersecurity environment that's managed and maintained by any on-site uh, by, by a group of people or a person. I think the blockchain way of working where everything is centralized, all the suppliers and manufacturers, they don't work internally. They work with a centralized piece of um, piece of kit, basically centralized point where all the data is amalgamated and, and, all, and everything can be seen from there. Everything can be um, managed from inside there. The only other way that it goes is is the government bringing legislation. Uh, so it, it will happen. It's just a case of when. Uh, I wouldn't bet my house on it. Absolutely. Um, uh, Val, I'll go, go to you almost a bit of a, a final final word, if you will, because um, clearly no business right now needs further legislation, regulation. We all want to grow, thrive and um, operate in a low tax, low legislative economy. Um, but it seems from the panellists' views that this might be down the track. What do manufacturers of all sizes and all sectors need to really be doing now so that actually we might not be in that position in the future? Yeah, um, manufacturing companies are, um, you know, they've got so much to lose uh, in lost operations. Um, and also the data that they carry, they're going to be ready to protect that data. They're going to be ready to, to um, you know, implement some kind of security framework to keep that attack surface minimized. Um, so, so they would need to, I, th I think the first task for them is to make sure that IT and OT, you know, that the owners are, are talking to each other, that there's that communication and cooperation between them. Um, the other thing about manufacturing firms is that they are, you know, there's got to be, you know, from a legislation point of view, um, nation states, they would typically target state backed manufacturing companies, right, um, to to minimize operations, right, we're seeing this now, uh, in, the, in the Russia Ukraine war. So there's got to be, um, there's got to be a focus and understanding and preparation on on making sure that that the manufacturing firms are, are indeed, um, you know, ready and, and protected. And, you know, the others have mentioned, the other panelists have mentioned accountability, and that's very, very important. We've got to identify who are the uh, the accountable people um, within the within within our manufacturing firms, especially the you know uh, the, the nation backed ones. Um, who are the most accountable? Who are liable? And who who need to respond? Who needs to respond to any legislations as they come uh, and, and are made available? Brilliant. Thanks for um, that, Val. Well, and thank you actually to all of our um, panellists for all of your insight. I think for James and I, we've probably gone away taking loads of insight and thinking, oh, we'll, what will be uh, the focus of uh, the next uh, cybersecurity report? Because there's loads of areas of interest that we can um, delve into. I mean, for me, um, we've, we've covered all of the ground, I think, today on cybersecurity and UK manufacturing. If I go back to kind of Mark's comments around you know, to, to make profit, you need to take risk. I think that's really is that, that key focus in terms of continuing to accelerate that digitalization and reap those benefits, but also to understand that in creating that more 
um, digitized environment, there are potential threats of which cyber, security, cyber attacks is one. And it is really important to make sure you are putting in those defenses and not just those limited defenses, but ones that will really protect your business. And um, um, hopefully we can have told all of those who have joined us today that this is not a, a cost, this is very much a return on investment. But thank you all to our panellists, Mark, James, Val and Tyler for all of your insights. Thank you to everyone on the call for joining and, and we hope you'll join us again soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.